Hello, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, college football fans across the nation and around the world. This is Tim May with the Tim May Podcast, edition 100 and something. And as usual, joining me in the cockpit, he was missing from last week's flight, took a sabbatical. That's okay. But Austin Ward, welcome back to the Tim May Podcast, my man. I just thought it was more important that, like, that is Berm's uh, version of Christmas, all the work that he puts in throughout the entire year. That Strike zone? A, yeah. Yeah, he had a lot more to offer than I did last week. And I know my place and I'm happy to give up my seat when it's in the best interest of the aircraft. Yeah. But I tell you what, man, uh, the thing about Berm is when he takes over and he gets his chance to fly, he does some loop de loops and stuff and kind of gets you a little, you know, a little bit nauseous there. You know what I mean? That's what you have to, you fly straight and level most of the time, my friend with a few banks and stuff. And that's what I, that's what I like about you. I can count on you, especially on final, right? Well, Hey, that's why, you know, having Burma around keeps it more entertaining and spicy. And, you know, sometimes that can be dangerous at 30,000 feet, but that's the, that's the fun we have. That's why he's so great to to have as my teammate. Yeah. But a lot of guys who aren't veterans don't understand how tricky the uh, air pressure is at 30,000 feet compared to sea level. Hey, (laughs) but I'm off the topic there. Did you see what I said there? But I'm, I've got off the topic. Yeah. I'm trying something out. Yeah. You know, when, when, when people, kind of come at you a little bit about your catchphrase, which everybody else caught on to and started using. And now they're jumping on your rear. end. They probably should jump on my rear end for basically starting that for one of another term or starting the, the uh, over the top usage of it. But, uh, but once again, I'm off topic. Let me get back on topic. Um, How long do you think this can last? Not very long. Cause I almost say it every day. I was on the radio show, you know, you were a guest on there earlier this week and uh, uh, you know, just four or five times, I just bit my tongue, man. It just it's tough once you get that once you get that habit going. Right. Let me ask you this, man: are you are you surprised that as we sit here right now, as we record this early in the week, uh, leading up to Christmas, that with everything going on, at least as I know, there hasn't been a full blown outbreak re outbreak of COVID amongst the Ohio State football team. What's 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 your feel for that? Yeah, I'm going to knock on wood right yeah. now with. With, uh, you know, Ohio State plans to leave on the 26th, uh, they're going to a place with one of the largest red dots on the map. Uh, so I am holding my breath that everything continues uh, on the path that we're on right now. And it, it doesn't seem like there's anything really in jeopardy as we sit here right now. And thank goodness for that, um, especially because the team that's across uh, a little side street over there on campus is in a complete shutdown with the basketball program. And that program is fully vaccinated and, uh, you know, still having to deal with uh, these tests, breakthrough tests and all that. And they will have missed two games uh, as of Tuesday night. Uh, Hopefully they can get back by next Tuesday. uh, Their first game, uh, next game on the schedule after Christmas there. Uh, I believe that's against new Orleans. And man, it's a, you look what's happening across the NFL you know, the Columbus Blue Jackets as well now uh, looped into this and, and yeah. on pause. Um, man, you, you hope that, that the Woody stays clean. They've done a great job of that. They did a great job of that last year and it still got into the facility. And it just shows you how um, perilous this stuff can be. Yeah. You know, it's amazing, though, as I'm Bo Bishop, I was on his show a couple of times in the last uh, several days uh, as a quote co host, end quote, kind of like you being my co pilot, except you, 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 you fly this plane a lot, a lot better than I co-host uh, with Bo, but <laughs> but I went off topic there for a second. See, I would have used that five times already. You see what I'm saying there? Uh, when are we going to get to the point, do you think, where when people have been vaccinated and they're either asymptomatic or have very slight, show very slight symptoms of this thing, they still test positive, but then quickly they, you know, usually they're moving away from it. When are we going? Do you think we're anywhere close to treating this almost like having a having a cold, from the standpoint of it being able to shut things down? I think the NFL is trying to lead the way yeah. in that regard, and um, you know, I, I would have if I had to guess, I would say that college athletics would be the slowest to come <laughs> around to that realization. That's just the way things work, and yeah. you know, you're also dealing with you know, not, not employees, um, you know, all those complications that we, we thought maybe we had left behind in in 2020 and 
um, all those are back and that's, that sucks that we're having this conversation again right now, but you know, I'm not a doctor and I'm not going to pretend to be one. Uh, everyone gets to do their own research online or wherever else and whatever the best practice is, uh, I will follow that. Yeah. Uh, you know, they, I think that the NFL, you know, they've been sort of, uh, the leader in this, you know, they, without having to do things in a full blown bubble, the way the NBA and the NHL did with some success or a lot of success that they got through their post seasons. Um, you know, I think that they're starting to, to the thinking on this is very different than it was last December. And I think that there's good reason for that. We know a lot more about it. Uh, we know that a lot of these tests for vaccinated people and with the new strains and all that, they tend to resolve itself pretty quickly as long as you've taken the necessary precautions in advance. So, you know, for asymptomatic people who are vaccinated, I don't I truly see a ton of benefit toward testing everybody and all you're going to wind up up with is an inability for anybody to work, not, not just play sports, but um, you know, I, I know there's no, per, no perfect solution, but I do think that they are going to, everybody is going to start following the lead of the NFL and treating this a little bit differently than they have been. Yeah, I, I agree with you. But like you said, you know, that there's still a risk involved, you know, and uh, if just one person, you know, one or two people end up with a serious situation, even though they have been vaccinated and, yep. and fully, uh, fully vetted in, in their vaccinations, you know, that could cause you a lot of problems down the road from a <laughs> legal standpoint, et cetera. It's really interesting, but you and I are both headed to the Rose Bowl, knock on wood at this moment. Right. And, uh, you know, are you feeling trepidations about that trip? I mean, you, you personally, um, I know, I know you would rather have gone to the desert at least, or maybe Atlanta, but, but that's another kind of trepidation. Go ahead now. Yeah. I, I'm a, I'm not concerned for myself. Um, you know, I, I, I'm going to get a, a booster. I'm fully vaccinated already. Yeah. You and I have both been that way uh, for quite some time. Um, and if they want to enforce, you know, indoor mask mandates and continue down, I, I'll do whatever whatever is required of us. So I'm not, I'm not worried about it from that regard. I am curious with some of the restrictions that are in place. They're being different than other bowl sites or postseason uh, activities. You know, I'm supposed to get there uh, on Monday, Ohio state's going to Disney world that day. Um, <laughs> that's, that's part of the plan. Uh, they're sending these guys out into a theme park. You know, they have events, uh, you know, going to the beef bowl and obviously media opportunities that we have scheduled uh, every day leading up to the bowl. How are they going to manage those? Cause it'll be different. We've worn masks inside the Woody for interviews all year. Yeah. Um, that policy has not changed. Players have been able to take them down. Uh, they're vaccinated. They're in a, we're kept, you know, several feet away from them. Uh, and that's worked just fine. Well, you know what the Rose bowl hasn't given any guidance one way or other about how they're going to handle these public events or media opportunities. Uh, I believe everyone has to wear a mask inside the Rose bowl to the game yep. on New Year's day. Um, you know, so in terms of team getting through that week and me getting through that week and media availability and normal business stuff that we've got to do. Um, I would like to know how that's going to work as we're sitting here a week out you know, from that really kicking into gear. And we don't really know. Yeah. What's interesting is uh, how limited even our, you know, media availabilities are going to be in the first place to, uh, to these guys and uh, guys and you know, players and coaches. And uh, and then if you add any more restrictions on, on top of that, you know, it's just it's just going to make it rough just to maybe gather info for one of another term uh, headed toward the game. I mean, that's that's what I'm looking at. Obviously, they're going to you know, the, the interview situations are always very well, very highly controlled. I'm not going to say well controlled. That would be giving it too much of a compliment, but very yeah. highly controlled in these situations. Not, and you kind of understand under the COVID things the way that would be, but, you know, 30 minutes for a, for a too deep roster, you know, availability is not giving you much, you know, for example. And that's one, you know, it's just you and me uh, are mainly me uh, griping about the situation, but uh, it is what it is at this point. But, you know, past well, that. It looks worse, Tim, if you do 45 minutes for five players. Five and a player. Yeah. Then 30 
it's two days later for the entire 2D. 48 that, people, that, yeah, or 44 not, people, yeah. Not checked out at all. Yeah, well, they may have two kickers and two punters there. We never know, right? <laughs> it might be 48. I doubt it. I bet I bet there's not more than 35 there, but I, I could be wrong. You know what I'm saying? Uh, but, uh, hey, real quick, uh, before I move, I've, I've, I've got a uh, an interview I did with Matt Zenitz of on 3 Dot com, but basically, for one of another term, he's a senior writer there. You know, the 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 in essence, the body, the uh, company that owns us owns Letterman Row uh, dot com, or we're part of them. Um, I like to feel like we're a big part of them, don't you? Awesome. I like, yeah, I like to feel that way. That's where I sneaked in that uh, the nickname there. We'll see if anybody ca- catches up to that. I might give a prize to somebody if they heard me call you what I just called you. But yeah, I like to think we are too. But uh, he's basically, for one of another uh, explanation, kind of in charge of their of the portal, the transfer portal, keeping up with that. You know, who knew, as I even asked him during the interview, who knew that, uh, you know, when you're 10 years old, aspiring to be a sports writer, that when you're 35, as he is, you know, you're going to end up uh, watching the transfer portal being one of your main beats. We are right. definitely in uncharted territory or territory that's just barely charted. Right. That's right. And uh you know, portal, portal gatekeeping, that's part of it. And yeah. uh, he's on top of it, has been doing that uh, very well. And we've had to call on him now to uh, for some assistance, the ones that we don't know about. I guess yeah. I shouldn't put it exactly like that. But there have been five uh, Ohio State players, scholarship players, go into the transfer portal at this point. Uh, and it doesn't take long when that happens for, for Matt Zenitz to pick up on it. Yeah, I was going to say in nine, really, since uh, since August have gone into it. But, you know, one of them walked off the field. He he walked off the field right into the portal. Uh, another <laughs> linebacker just sort of like one day said, I'm going somewhere else. I'm talking about Dallas Camp, the the latter, the former being Kevon Pope. And then, uh, of course, there's a guy that wasn't even on the team who's listed as being a transfer uh, from Ohio State who was kicked off the team last year for problems. Uh He's in the portal. And, of course, uh, two, two quarterbacks since the end of the regular season have moved in there, Jack Miller and Quinn Ewers. Quinn, we barely got to know you, man. Uh, but, uh, yeah, it is an interesting part of college football anymore that's only going to get more interesting because teams can re- reshape themselves uh, through the portal. Teams can also lose vital parts to the portal, like Virginia has lost, like, what, 14, 13, 14, 15 players as we speak right now. Could be more than that. Uh, that's crazy <laughs> to lose that many people with eligibility remaining. You know, obviously you 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 get you change coaches and different things can happen, right? I mean, we're just in a – this is just a, like a, I called it the other day when, uh, when Ryan Day was talking about it. It's like a tornado kind of like thing that coaches are dealing with now and player personnel people like Mark Pantone. It's crazy, isn't it? It is, and – at some point, it'll have to find a level, and that will involve everybody from programs to the players themselves. If you look around and see, you know, whatever it is, 1,500 people in there right now, and yeah. 6% are finding new homes because there isn't a limitless supply of scholarship spots available in other schools. You know, I think everybody's going through all this stuff, name, image, likeness, one-time transfer, free transfer, all this stuff. They're all – it's all the first time there's going to be learning experiences and it's unfortunate in some cases that it'll come with a heavy price and there won't be a great benefit. I mean, I don't know. We'd have to ask Craig young if he thought that Kansas would be the ideal landing spot when he left Ohio state and really in a position where he could have still contributed and got a lot better, even if he wasn't a starter, Um, you know, who knows what would have happened in the spring, but I think that he probably had higher hopes for his career than playing in Kansas, no offense to Kansas, but, that's just not the same situation. And that's a reminder that on this you know, game of musical chairs, they're pull, they're being pulled out at the same time. Yes. You don't have to walk around and around and around and find out a, a magical spot, whatever you think is the best one. So yeah. you have to think about that. And I, um, there are these lessons that will be learned as we get in a year, two years, three years removed from the rule change. Yeah, I think the Jameson Williams thing uh, transferred from Ohio State to Alabama and becoming an instant hit down there, and especially may, maybe one of the most valuable members of that team now with, with the Mechie kid hurt uh, for Alabama, uh, the James and Williams things is a rare occurrence in this situation. Justin Fields transferring from Georgia to Ohio State, but that was before it was just free. You could go 
and play immediately. Uh, Justin Fields had to go before the arbitration board, you know, so to speak, and uh, arbitrarily be deemed eligible. Uh, you know, and, and obviously what he did for Ohio State was, was huge on his way to becoming a first round draft pick. But uh, boy, you have that example. You have 10 examples over here where things did not work out like a lot of these guys thought they would. So, hey, let's get to my conversation with Matt Zinnis. You and I will come back and we'll talk a little bit about that and where maybe Ohio State might try to help itself in the portal, but also looking forward, you know, on who we think is going to play uh, at this moment in the Rose Bowl, who might not play is more the, the better point of putting it. But let's get to my uh, conversation with Matt Zinnitz. As promised, ladies and gentlemen, I'm dropping in on an on three. Uh, is it what do you call it? On three dot com. How would you how would you describe it, Matt? On three dot com. Yeah, oh. on three dot com colleague, right? I mean, I work for Letterman Road, do stuff for Letterman Road dot com. Matt Zenitz, uh basically is one of the senior writers at on three dot com. Um, one of the great sites out there now where you can find out all kinds of information. And Matt, for one of another term, I I uh sort of look at you as right now as the transfer portal observer for, for on three. Am I put, am I, am I selling you too short there? Uh, I, I think that sums up a, a decent amount of daily responsibilities trying to be on top of uh, the never ending or consistently growing list of, of guys going into the, the transfer portal and everything going on from that perspective definitely takes up a decent amount of time at this point, as I'm sure you can imagine. As this thing has picked up the transfer portal, which was agreed to, you know, a little while ago, and uh, seems to pick up numbers every year. But, you know, give me a ballpark of how many guys you think are in the transfer portal right now, or at least have used it since August. Uh, if it pulled it up on on the computer right now, I could give you the, the exact number, but it's in uh, probably the thousands hey, at this point since, since August. And yeah. Since regular season ended, I, I guess we're mid-December right now, so, so we've got a couple of weeks since the regular season ended. Since that point, we've obviously seen set some high-profile guys, guys go in. Spencer Rattler to the world, said some guys who are very much known on, the, on a national level. But th- there have been some days in there where just looking specifically at, at Power 5 scholarship players, th- there have probably been in the range of 100 players on a given day that have gone in probably at the peak of all of this during the course of the last couple of weeks and probably just during these last two weeks alone, um, this is ju- just an estimate. That, but there have probably been an excess of a, a couple thousand guys that, that have gone in even just during the course of the, these last couple of weeks, and, and that's limited to, ju- to just uh, scholarship Power 5 players. Yeah, Definitely a lot of movement and yeah. more and more coming also. You know, I was, I've was i talked about this for a while now, and people have asked me, you know, uh, how much is name, image, and likeness going to impact, you know, college football, major college football. That's what we're talking about here. We're not talking about the rest of the sports. Uh, and I said, you know, I've always thought the transfer portal has has the pro, has the ability to, to impact it much more so than name, image, and likeness because if you're a pretty good player, you're going to end up with a deal wherever you line up. And wherever you end up, I guess, is the best way of putting it. And I think I'm wrong. I mean, I like the way uh, Michigan State and Mel Tucker basically restructured their team uh, through the transfer portal and other means uh, just over the – compared to a year ago, the, you know, they were in contention, at least until they ran into the buzzsaw at Ohio State, you know, for the Big Ten East Division title. Uh, and uh, it's crazy how much better they were than they were the year before. But you look around the country, a lot of teams are benefiting and and a lot of pe- teams are really getting hurt by the transfer portal. And I'm just wondering, before we get into it, brass tacks, what is just your – your take, I mean, you're, you're reporting, you know, you're observing it, but uh, is it, are there more people jumping in than even you envisioned uh, when this thing came about? I think part of the reason for it right now, it's become kind of a, a buzzy thing where um, kids are, are hearing transfer portal stuff thrown out there and it's become kind of a, a buzzy thing right now where uh, I, I, I think it, Adds even more to the consideration to, to go in if, if an individual player isn't happy with, with their situation. Just the fact that here, as much as we all do on a, a daily basis, a regular basis, as far as guys going into the portal, that I, I think it increases the, the amount of guys that, that go in because uh, these 18 to 22 year olds um, they associate with this maybe with being a buzzy, cool thing right now, yeah. uh, which, which for some of them, 
uh, I unfortunately don't come out with the kind of outcome that they're looking for and, and probably expecting when they initially go into the, the portal. But th- this, I, I guess the big picture part of it has become college's version of a, a free agency where you look at the NFL level uh, teams that aren't great one year can completely change the, their outlook very quickly based on what they're able to do in free agency. If they can add some key players and Michigan State's a perfect example where that, that roster wasn't exactly in great shape from a personnel standpoint last year and did, did a great job bringing in essentially some college uh, free agents, some guys who were available like the Kenneth Walkers of the world and were able to quickly I- improve from a personnel standpoint and overall improve their, their roster. And the, the, the thing that has been a game changer to, to go along with just the, the transfer portal is that the fact that guys have immediate, immediate eligibility. So in the past, when you dealt with transfers, I obviously, and, and you know this, uh, going back a couple of years ago, guys still had to sit out one full year before being eligible if they were making the move from one FBS school to another. That is not the case anymore. You get one free transfer where guys have that immediate eligibility, and it, it adds even more to, to this becoming really college's version of a free agency. Yeah. You know, but the thing is, you know, obviously – Justin Fields, when he transferred to Ohio State, uh, he had to go before the board, so to speak, you know, uh, and plead his case of why he got. But it was so arbitrary the way they were allowing some guys to play immediately, some guys not. I mean, they finally just threw up their hands because there was a lot of griping going on, and I think for good reason, for because some of the reasons given for transferring, boy, that really – that really bothered you, you know? I mean, okay, but here you go. But, uh, you know, they had to go to finally let everybody uh, just have that one shot at it. Uh, just, you know, just from your vantage point, for example, since August, Ohio State has had, I think, nine fellas enter the transfer portal. A couple of them uh, really weren't part of the plans, and uh, one that uh, wasn't even on the team uh, when he went into it. But, uh, but you know, obviously they've lost two quarterbacks to it now, Jack Miller and Quinn Ewers probably <laughs> the most top profile player to go into the portal this year. I don't know if you agree or not, but I mean, the number one player in the class uh, when he reclassified from 22 to 21 lasted all of what, four months at Ohio state. But uh, it, it it's kind of stunning. Who's, who's, who's becoming impatient and stepping into it, isn't it? It's just the, the reality of the, the current situation. So I, I, I think, I mean, you bring up Quinn we, with quarterbacks, especially guys who, are very confident in their abilities and expect to be playing if they're not getting that opportunity at their, their current situation, then they're going to go in the portal uh, and find a, a spot where they, they're able to get out on the field and, and play. So yeah. with Quinn, you see it around the country with quarterbacks who are, are not getting the level of playing time or not in the, the position that they would want at their, their current situation. And that's something else where uh, the, the immediate eligibility aspect of it, where you can leave, go somewhere else, be immediately, immediately eligible it leads even more to some of these guys making that move and a certain level of impatience to, to a certain degree. Yes. Yeah, waiting out and, and maybe biding their time and waiting for opportunity at their, their current school, um, wanting just the, the immediate gratification and wanting to, to get that opportunity instead of having to wait potentially a couple of years to, to get that chance. Yeah. And that gratification goes two ways. I mean, you know, Alabama left no, left no secret that it wanted to get a, a wide receiver this past year that could take the top off the defense, you know, Jameson Williams, <laughs> who was a fourth string, well, not fourth string, he's probably the fourth, not fourth string, fourth receiver uh, yeah. for Ohio State, uh, goes to Alabama uh, in, the, in the late spring. And next thing you know, you know, boy, he's really their guy now going into this, uh, going into the playoffs with Mechie Hurt. But it's amazing the impact he had for what is now the number one team in the country. And yet there's still, you would look at it, he would not have been, a starter still at Ohio State, probably, you know, and yet he did find he did find paradise to a certain extent at Alabama. But uh, Nick Saban left no doubt that they needed a guy like him. So, you know, what's sort of like rubbing this genie lamp right now? Do you think is it is it people putting out the help wanted sign, or is it guys wanting to go somewhere to get a shot immediately? It's probably both, right? Yeah, combination of both and. Uh... Uh, piggyback off what you said about Jameson Williams, it's kind of crazy, all, all of the talent that Ohio State had in that, that receiver room. And yeah. obviously, Brian Hartline's done a hell of a job recruiting there in terms of the receivers they've been able to bring in. And I, obviously, the, the, the development's been pretty damn good also 
uh, considering what those guys have become since, since getting on to, to campus. So it kind of speaks to uh, the, the job that the Brian Hartline, who I know is a, a very popular guy there in Columbus, just the, the job that he's doing, but from a recruiting standpoint and then also coaching to, to go along with that. Yeah, but, you know, do, do, do you sense – or as you, as you monitor this, you not only see who's coming out, but see where they're going and stuff – do you see a lot of help wanted signs being answered? You, you know what I'm saying? I mean, uh, either by, you know, either by your third uncle or whomever is involved, you know, now these guys all have reps, can all have reps, representatives uh, for their name, image, and likeness stuff who are also, you know, looking to help them find that new paradise, as I call it. I think that was part and parcel a little bit to, to, to the Quinn Ewers leaving, uh, but, you know, it's, do, do, do you see as many teams hanging out a shingle saying, hey, we need help here? Uh, is, is that proliferating, I guess, uh, across the country? Yeah, you're, you're seeing schools probably um, saving spots for, for transfers more so than, than what you had seen in the past. I mean, I, I was talking to a coach earlier today who, hey, at this point, they, they're probably looking to take in as many as 10 transfers leading yeah. up to next season. And um, again, the, the immediate eligibility part c- contributes to, to, to that, but the, these schools have, have, have all uh, and, and will all identify clear needs for, for themselves going into the, the offseason where if you have a, a, a game-changing type player that, that comes available that you feel like can help you at the, the spots um, or, or one of those spots, then um, you're seeing these schools look to pull the trigger and, and, and make those moves. And I, obviously, you've seen Jamison Williams with Alabama. You've seen Kenneth Walker with Michigan State. You've seen that, some situations during the course of even just this last year that have ultimately been very good fit for not only player being able to go in and get that the kind of opportunity that, that they're looking for, but schools being able to, um, along the lines of what you said, fill some of these needs that they had identified as areas where they, they need to get better or want to get better throughout the course of the offseason. Yeah, like Alabama. I mean, they got the linebacker, what, from Tennessee uh... – I always yeah. mispronounce that. Uh, uh, yeah. What? Go ahead, you pronounce yeah. it. Yeah, Henry Toatoa. So that, yeah. that's another one where they wanted to upgrade an inside linebacker. Had uh, somebody going to the portal who had been a high level player in the the, the SEC throughout the course of the last couple of years, and um, ended up being a fit for both sides. Yeah, I was going to say Ohio State wanted him too. You know, I mean, there's a it, that's what's the interesting part to me is the recruiting. Once they enter the portal, the recruiting starts all over for these guys. Maybe at even a more intense level because you've got video on this guy where you know he can help you if you get him, right? I mean, it's an it's a very interesting part, right? Yep, I, absolutely. Yeah, you know, yeah. and I, I've watched, you know, Mark Pantone, you know, was uh, was looking at, uh, he, you know, the recruiting coordinator for Ohio State, the personnel director for Ohio State, you know, tweeted during on, on National Signing Day is what I call it now because uh, the, the one in February now is like the uh, – the secondary signing day, the way I look at things. <laughs> uh, but uh, he was already, already, you know, uh, tweeted that he was already looking at uh, video of guys in the transfer portal, you know, who can help you next, get those two or three guys or maybe one or two. And that that really has doubled the work almost for those branches of these major programs, hasn't it? Yeah, and it's led to set some additional hires being made where, where you've seen a lot of programs around the country ha- having guys that they brought in specifically did help with evaluating transfer portal uh, and, and transfer guys that have gone into the, the portal. So, so it's led to some new positions being created at the college football level just to, to help these teams stay on top of what's going on as far as the portal and who's actually worth going after. Yeah, but, I mean, it's also like for you, for example, I mean, on 3.com, <clears throat> I think you're considered the 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 portal watcher, the portal expert and stuff. It's – you have to have guys like that if you have recruiting services now, right? To, I mean, that's that's as big, if not bigger, deal than even the recruiting. I mean, you agree? I mean, it's a separate branch of the recruiting. So, I mean, it's yeah. like, a, yeah, a, a different part of it. So, you have the high school recruiting, and now you essentially have the college recruiting with the, the, the transfer portal. How do you become an expert on the transfer portal, Matt? Uh same way you become an expert on recruiting, right? You see who's in it. You see who gets in it. You see where they're exactly. going. You make phone calls. I mean, it's right. It's, work is work, right? Yeah. Just try to stay on top of stuff as much as can on a daily basis. So uh, no, no different than uh, covering high school recruiting or anything else that we're all responsible for, for covering. Just try to stay on top of this stuff as much as can. Definitely keeps me busy, though. 
Oh yeah, I know, man. I'm getting you. I'm wedging you in in between, uh, you know, going to Christmas uh, pageants with your two year old and being on the phone again. I'm glad you took the time. I want to ask you this: so who who appears to be? Maybe, maybe you don't have a gauge on this yet, but you might have a kind of feel for it. Who appears to be wanting to be most active in the portal as far as like trying to attract players uh, uh, so far and in, heading into 2022? Have you noticed? Have you picked up on anything? I mean, uh, uh, obviously Oklahoma's. Had some guys leave. Uh, Virginia's had like what twelve or thirteen or fourteen guys leave and stuff. But who's out there like looking? Yeah. Go, ahead, go ahead. What? Not saying including three starting offensive linemen. Eight yeah. As far as Virginia. So yeah. How do you how do you fill that gap? I mean, that's interesting. But who, who do you see out there as like being sort of active and like wanting to be attractive in this deal? Yeah. So in terms of individual teams, so when you're dealing with like the, the Ohio State, Alabama's of the world, Oklahoma, schools like that, uh, typically, and, and, and I, I know you've seen this also, typically with those kinds of schools, the, the, the only players that they're going to target and try to bring in are truly elite players that, that can be immediate impact guys at a very, very high level. I, I think the schools that are more active in terms of trying to bring in five, seven, ten transfers in a given year, schools that hey, have struggled coming out of that, that respective season. Um, so, so Michigan State last year, for example. Last year was not a great year for Michigan State. Identified some, some clear areas that they needed to upgrade, get better, and, and it led to them bringing in a, a decent amount of guys during the, this past cycle. Unfortunately for them, uh, we, with Kenneth Walker to the world and some guys like that, they, they were able to significantly upgrade their roster. Yeah. Uh, couple that with the major coaching changes that have gone on this year. I mean, yeah. coach goes from Notre Dame to LSU. The head coach goes from Oklahoma to USC. Are you kidding me? You know that would have never yeah. happened in you know in my and when I when I was a youngster, so to speak. Of course, that was a long time ago. <laughs> but that's helped snowball this a little bit, hadn't it? I mean, guys, look, you know, uh, Bronco Mendenhall resigns at uh, Virginia, and suddenly, you know. A third of their team, uh, or well, at least a fifth of their team, is is uh, into the portal and stuff. I mean, is that kind of helping helping this thing fuel this fire, or fill the portal? What, what, how would you describe it? You know, a certain degree. So, with like Oklahoma, for example, after Lincoln Riley left Oklahoma for USC, you, you saw some players who hey, have been contributors for for Oklahoma that went in the portal and. Uh, now, Brent Venables is going through the process as far as some of the guys that they would like to keep there, trying to re-recruit them and get yeah. them to ultimately withdraw from the portal. And they were able to, to accomplish that with former five-star receiver Theo Weiss, who during the course of the last couple of days actually withdrew from the portal. But, yeah, that, that's definitely contributed to it. So I, I, I'm pretty confident saying that if Bronco Mendenhall hadn't left Virginia, that, that you wouldn't – be in the situation right now where there have been double digit guys or whatever it's been from Virginia that have gone in the portal during the course of the last couple of weeks, including the, the aforementioned three offensive linemen, including one who was one of the three finalists for, for the Remington award is best center in the, the country. So that has definitely been a contributing factor to, to some of this, but hey, at the same time, uh, even if you didn't have the, the coaching changes, there was naturally going to be, a, a lot in terms of movement and guys going into the portal just because of the, the fact that wait, when you're playing at the FBS Power 5 level, these are guys that want to play. They have aspirations most of the time of getting to the NFL level and in order to get there and need an opportunity to, to get out and play, put stuff on film and all of that. And there, there's a certain level of impatience also where you want to, as quickly as possible, get on the field. And when you're not accomplishing that in your current situation, uh, you're saying a lot right now where, where guys are going to, to look to go the route of the portal and find a situation that helps them get on the field a, a little bit quicker. So even if it weren't for the coaching changes, you were still going to see a, a ton of movement as, as far as the portal. And like I said, uh, even with us having seen a good amount already, you're, you're going to see a lot more uh, during the course of the, these next couple of months also uh, coming out of signing day right now where – Guys who were on campus see some of the players that were brought in and maybe impacts their current situation. You obviously have winter workouts where guys will go through the process of uh, seeing their, their situation even more and identifying just what the, their outlook is for the season. And then obviously after spring ball, spring ball, uh, you, you're going to see kind of what you saw a couple of weeks ago coming out of the regular season where if guys don't feel like they're in a good situation for moving forward and not in a spot to, to get the kind of playing time that, 
they want, then you're going to see an influx of guys coming into the portal at that point also. So, yeah, you know, uh, Ohio State's had two famous guys so far in the last couple of years, really famous. Joe Burrow left after he didn't win or at least cement the starting job and goes to LSU in 2000, what, 18. And uh, I had a so-so year and then had had a, one of the great years in college football history. The next year becomes the number one pick in the draft, blah, blah, blah. Uh, Jameson Williams, we saw do the same thing and stuff. Uh, who's a quarterback out there right now? Spencer Rattler obviously has gone to South Carolina. Is there somebody who has the capability uh, of like a quarterback who may find, well, I keep using that term paradise, you know, again, I mean, Spencer Rattler was the starter at the beginning of the year. Caleb Williams comes along, saves the Texas game, and then boom, you know, he's the guy at Oklahoma. So Spencer Rattler wants to change his luck. The kid at UCF that got hurt and uh, entered the portal. I mean, who, who's a quarterback out there that you think right now uh, can, could end up being sort of a Joe Burrow-esque kind of guy in uh, 2022? Spencer Rattler is going to be one of the more interesting ones. So obviously like going into this year, uh, whether, whether it was justified or not, Spencer Rattler, who it was talked about – uh, when it came to mock drafts and all his potential number one overall yeah. pick, and obviously the year didn't go as as he planned for it for it to go, but gets an opportunity now to to go to South Carolina and help them take that program to a, an even greater level than they were this year as kind of a 500 middle tier team in the, the SEC. Um, but it, but at the same time. Uh, try to put himself back in a situation where he has a chance to go at some point early in the draft. So that that'll be one of more interesting ones. Quinn, yours, I, obviously Texas uh, was very, very much up and down a, at the quarterback position throughout the course of this year. Uh, who, who have a chance to, to go in there, could compete to be the guy right away and see if he can help them upgrade uh, compared to where they were through, throughout the course of the, the season, which would be very much uh, needed there. Dylan Gabriel from UCF, who you brought up, going out to UCLA is another one. Yeah. The, the same thing with him. Uh, we was probably set to, to go to Ole Miss before everything played out like it did with Oklahoma, which we, with Brett Venables going there, uh, ultimately took Ole Miss's offense coordinator, Jeff Levy, who was Dylan Gabriel's connection to Ole Miss, which ended up changing things up for him and leading to, to Dylan ending up at UCLA. So he's out there now with Chip Kelly. That, that'll be another interesting one. It's a guy who, as recently as a year ago, 2020, led, led the nation in passing through for almost 360 yards per game. He's got some quarterbacks who are available, like, like Bo Nix from Auburn, who, who's been a multi-year starter there. Um, had schools like, like Cincinnati brought up as potential landing spots for him. Yeah. So and they, they, there are a lot of guys who, who um, not only could go into a situation where have a chance to be a high-level player right away, but um, just – be, Flourish, be, right? Yeah, be in a spot where uh, could, could be potential game changers for some, some of these programs. And, hey. I mean, it, it's been crazy with the, the quarterback position, especially because I mean, those are those are just a, a few of a, a number of uh, starting level guys that have gone in. You've had Michael Penix from uh, from, from Indiana, who, who obviously has done some good things there uh, before getting set back by by injuries. Yeah, you've had Adrian Martinez from, from Nebraska. There, there have been a ton of quarterbacks who are known guys on a national level that uh, have played, started, contributed at a high level that now are on different teams. Okay, Matt, how old are you? I'm old. I, I'm 35. Yeah, boy, man, yeah, you're you're almost t- you're a little over half my age. I'm 67. I yeah. want to ask you this: Are you stunned by how this thing has taken off? I mean. You know, I think we're talking about a couple of, like you said, a couple thousand maybe in the transfer portal this year. What some of them have dripped out into different places, like we just talked about. But are you are you are you stunned by how many people are trying to take advantage of this to improve themselves, uh, and or maybe being urged? You know, hey, I don't think you're going to play here, but you know, you can do whatever you want to do. You know that yeah. that does give uh, programs that out too, right? Yeah. I, I don't know. Surprise would be the, the right word, but the, the thing that I, I'm interested to see moving forward is just, I mean, you, you've seen some, some players like the ones that we've talked about who hey, have ended up in good situations and been able to, to get the playing time that they want and um, ha, have ultimately kind of outlook or, or outcome that they would have wanted when, when going into the transfer portal. But at the same time, there, there have been significantly more guys that, that have gone in probably with unrealistic expectations who 
either have gotten lost in the portal and haven't gotten anywhere close to the kind of opportunity that they were looking for, or, or ended up in a situation where maybe it was a, a good school and something they were excited about initially, but didn't yeah. get the kind of playing time that, that ultimately wanted. So um, I, I think with the, the transfer portal that, and I know um, coaches harp on this with players as they're going through the process of figuring out whether to enter and all of that, but, more often than not, especially if you're not a top tier elite player, um, you're, you're seeing guys who, who get lost in the, the, the portal and don't get anywhere close to the, the, the kind of outcome that they are expecting way when they initially go in and, and just making kind of short sighted decisions and not understanding or having a full understanding of just uh, the, the portal deal when initially going in. Yeah. Just because you want to go somewhere doesn't mean somebody has a spot for you. Hey, uh, last thing you know, I want to ask you a little bit about, about your background. Uh, Ohio State, I think for the most part, has played the portal pretty well. I mean, you know, they had Jonah Jackson, a kid from Rutgers, you know, on that team a couple of years ago, you know, along with Justin Fields and and uh, right on down the line is uh, – do, do you see the, the big-time programs losing more than they pick up from the portal? I mean, well, how, how do you – you know, we talked about that a little bit a minute ago and stuff, but they're like you said, they're they're mainly trolling for the cherry to put on top of the the Sunday, right? I mean, that's that's the kind of player they're looking for, like an Ohio State, like an Alabama, right? Yep, yeah, you're absolutely going to see those those kinds of schools losing more than they ultimately bring in. It goes back to just the, those schools, the, those top tier tier one programs. Uh, being very selective when it, when it comes to transfers and who they're bringing in, because typically with the Ohio States, Alabama's of the world, um, they, they've recruited at such a high level that some of these guys who are going into the portal don't necessarily represent upgrades for them at, at whatever individual position it, it is. So I, I think more so when it comes to, to those kinds of schools, you, you'll see guys who have come in as four or five star recruits who aren't playing right, right away or you know, a situation hasn't played out like they wanted immediately going in and uh, being very much of interest to some of these tier two or tier three programs who uh, see that that player is an upgrade and somebody that can come in and, and play right away. Yeah. I was going to say, uh, when you saw Ohio state had, uh, had CJ Stroud, uh, uh, Kyle McCord, uh, Jack Miller and uh, Quinn Ewers all in the same quarterback room in late August, even you, you knew, one, possibly two of those names weren't going to be there by, by right about now, right? I mean, it's turned out that way, right? Yeah, 100%. It looks like a complete inevitability. So, yeah. But by the way, uh, real quick, I want to get your background. You started uh, covering uh, stuff for whom and how did you uh, move on to on three? Just give me quick people a quick little background, where you're from, et cetera. Yeah. So, so to avoid completely boring people, I, I'll limit it to just the last few years, but I'm originally from Maryland. Um, but before most recent stop, before on three, hey, had covered uh, University of Maryland football, University of Maryland basketball. So I have experience with, with Big Ten there uh, for, for the Baltimore Sun. Uh, did that during the, the course of 2014 season, football season, and then had opportunity to come about to cover at that point Alabama Um which was early 2015, made that move, role progressed to, to covering the SEC as a whole. Uh, we was there all the way through, I guess, the midpoint of this year, and then made the move to, to on three. So made the transition from, from being focused on the SEC to, to now, like, like you mentioned earlier, uh, covering college football on a national level for on three and trying to be on top of things on national level as much as can be on a, a daily basis. Definitely keeps me busy. Did you always dream when you were a kid of one of your one of your primary chores being watching the transfer portal? Did you dream about that as a as a kid? Oh, all I know is that right now one of my wife's dreams is taking my phone and throwing it out the window. Yeah. So I don't even know what my dreams are at this point. Um, but but I, I can tell you very confidently that uh, one of my wife's dreams would be to be able to get a hold of my phone and either throw it against the wall or throw it out of uh, window based on what she's had to deal with during the course of these last few weeks. Yeah, and as you well know, and I well know, because I was a, a bit of sports writer since I was 19, and I covered Ohio State since 1984, you know. and uh, But uh, – Stuff always happens on the holidays too, man. You can count on it, you know, where you're going to miss something and you're going to regret it uh, 20, 30 years later. But at the time, it seems so damn important, right? Hey, it happened on Halloween. So we had 
it was going to be the first real trick or treating experience for, for our two year old. And right when we are getting ready to leave the house, we had gotten in the family costumes, all of that, had everyone together, getting ready to walk out the door. And something that had been working on for, for legitimately two weeks ended up breaking at a point when I was not expecting at all for it to actually break. Gary Patterson getting fired at TCU. Yeah. Literally happened when we were about to walk out the door. Yeah. Um, so, okay, consistently happens. I'm right there with you. Yeah, it gotcha. never fails the holidays, uh, Christmas, Halloween, wait, wait, whatever. They, there's consistently something that, that will drop. Gotcha. Well, Matt, uh, from a veteran to a basically a veteran, but a young up and coming veteran, I appreciate you coming on the Tim May podcast, man. I, I appreciate it. I appreciate you having me. Yeah, you know, uh, Austin, I almost called you awesome there. Austin, I had to, I had to stammer there just to correct myself. Uh, as Matt Zenitz, you know, and I were talking about, man, yeah, I, I got a feeling this portal is going to get more busy maybe in, a, in the next year or so. And then it's going to, I think, start to taper off. What, what, is, your, what is your take? Yeah, I think that that's, that's a, I agree with you. I think that's probably what will happen as more people start to realize that there is no, you know, perfect scenario out there for everybody. And that you leap at the opportunity just because you don't play in your first year or two that another major program is going to be there waiting for you brought up Jamison Williams and that was you know those are very rare circumstances and they lined up perfectly for him but a lot of times you see that it doesn't and you know whether that's already the case for uh, Craig Young that we brought up or, or Jack Miller that hey uh, you weren't a starter or a backup at Ohio state. That doesn't mean that you're about to go become one at another premier program instantly overnight. Like, you know, these things are difficult. The spots are competitive. There are a limited number of scholarships available. And I'm not saying that all players have to just blindly stick it out for four or five years at some place. And if they never play fine, whatever. I mean, I'm, I understand that kids want to play and go to, uh, find opportunities that maybe maybe they didn't really see eye to eye with the coach or the scheme and, and all these other or they don't like the weather that all that stuff's fine and I think just like I've said with name image and likeness and all this other stuff I'm I'm all for that for the players to get paid to have the freedom to do stuff that their coaches are free to do I I, I have no issues with that whatsoever I just think everybody is learning how to use those things for the first time that includes coaches, that includes, includes players when it comes to name, image, and likeness, that includes businesses. Like everybody's got to learn the best way forward because you know, like free agency didn't destroy the NFL and people were really ter terrified of that or major league baseball. Yeah. You learn how to use it better. And that's what's going to happen. There's going to be an education process for all these new tools. Yeah. But like, for example, if Quinn Ewers had just stayed on schedule, you know, he would have had a year apprenticeship and then he would have been battling Cal McCord probably for the starting job and or Jack Miller. You know, right. I can understand Jack Miller leaving, to be honest, for a lot of reasons. Number one, he did not emerge as the backup quarterback to C.J. Stroud. You've got this other young guy, you know, who knew really Quinn Ewers was leaving, although it was rumored for a while. But uh, then there's going to be somebody else coming in the door. You know, why not take a shot somewhere else? I understand that. You know, yeah. uh, uh, it's – do you really want to go somewhere, though, where they are – desperate for a quarterback, you know, <laughs> uh, well, yeah, you do, you know, <laughs> if, if you've got a couple of years in maybe, but, yeah. but then on the, the other side, what does that tell you about that team to begin with? You know? So it's like, and like uh, Craig Young, you know, Ohio State figured out a way to get him on the field at the end of the year. And uh, sometimes was, he was quite effective in his role. Uh, does he see his role being bigger at Kansas? Probably. He's probably going to be the best athlete on that side of the ball for Kansas. Yeah. He's playing for Kansas, you know, and, uh, you know, you make a big play against uh, Michigan State when it's number four versus number seven. And a lot of people saw that play. If you made a big play for Kansas against Kansas State, when who when who cares is watching, you know, who saw that play? Where do you get more bump? You know, uh, you do get more video uh, when you're at a place like Kansas and you're the, the number one player on that side of the ball. But, uh, you know. What good does that do you? I mean, really down the road, I'm not knocking any of these guys. They make their own decisions or some other people are making those decisions for them. Clearly, a lot of these guys have have little uh, uh, birdies tweeting in their ear, you know, like Ryan Watts, for example. I liked him a lot. He started the opener and uh, had a big upside. 
kind of got beat out as the year went on. I mean, uh, obviously, Austin moved another direction in the cornerback room. He was making some damn good plays on special teams, for example, though. He was hanging in there, and who knows when the next opportunity is coming. But, for example, if you're here in Scuttlebutt, that Cam Brown is coming back, like you you talked about on the radio this week. Uh, well, you've got at least one more year where you're – at best, uh, the backup, and maybe you get to start if Cam Brown can't play, right, or is banged up. But I understand the frustrations that boil boil up sometimes. But, you know, it's just – I think it's just for fans and stuff, it's just hard to kind of keep up with who's going in and out the door from a coaching standpoint. We'll get on that in a minute. But uh, but from a player standpoint, right, I mean, it's, it's kind of like building your brand. Well, I think that one – solution to all this and the NCA will be putting its fingers in its ears and saying, no, 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 don't say it. Well, they know what's going to happen eventually is they're going to lose all these lawsuits and they will be forced to admit that these are employees. But the good news is that once that happens, which I think is inevitable, then you get to sign your employees to contracts. So what will alleviate a lot of these concerns with uh, massive bidding wars on signing day or uh, go- players going in the transfer portal after playing two snaps in their career. Well, make them, make them sign a two-year contract or they can go somewhere else. And I know that that then opens up a different conversation. Well, this place offered a four-year contract and this place offered a one and this one is doing two. Well, you know what? That's how the real world works. That's how it works at the NFL level. And I know that there is, they've always tried to, differentiate themselves and that this is about the student athletes. I mean, that charade is over. I mean, we have to be real about that. They lost that. They lost that war. Well, you've been you trying to be real about that since I met you, man. How come people aren't jumping in behind you, voting uh, you president or something? Go ahead now. But I mean, whether you long for the glory days of college football and the way that it used to be, or you love the new era, it doesn't matter. Yeah. This is the way it is now. Yeah. So, if that's where it's heading, one the main solution, in my opinion, is that they just give it up with the amateurism status, which they really have stopped fighting that war by and large, but they, they're drawing the line in the sand that, well, these can't be employees. Well, they can be. And that's probably the best thing for the NCAA and college football and college athletics in general. Yeah. You know, it'd be funny if they were four-year contracts, though, and you want to leave after three but whoever draft, let's say you go for the NFL draft and whoever drafts you then has to pay a buyout <laughs> portion of your contract, you know, then, then the, the, the university would be making money or the uh, football department would make be making money off of you leaving early. I mean, it would be a win-win, right? Yeah. Now, I mean, that's the part I will, I won't sit here and, and say that I've drawn up all these contracts or that I'm a lawyer and, and know all the other ramifications for that. Yeah. Well, that that's trending that way, and it and maybe maybe someone will be on here and illuminate me about why that's wrong. But I, I just don't think that there's any way the NCA can continue to fight that war and win it. I mean, it, it seems like every time it's gone to Supreme Court or any judge has a say, they immediately smack down the NCA talking about amateurism status and you know trying to keep them from transferring or name, image, and likeness, like. Uh, every every battle they fight, they lose. Yeah. And I can't imagine that's one they would even hope to win. Yeah. I, I just think it's really interesting, though, because there's 130 teams, whatso, so to speak, in uh, the FBS. They can't all afford to pay players. You know, it'd be coming out of the general fund. And yeah. like you and I have talked about many times, I'll say it again, they're not – Ohio U and Ohio State are the same thing in the NCAA's eyes in terms of – major college football program, but they are light years separated. Doesn't mean Ohio you can't get a good football team and beat Ohio State. It's not what I'm talking about, but I'm talking about the wherewithal is totally yeah. different. <laughs> and uh, facilities, uh, amount of money generated, um, uh, self, self, uh, self-providing, uh, self-providing program, uh, self-sustaining program is the word I was really looking forward there, forward okay. to there. Uh, all of those things are so – that's why the NCAA is what it is. The NCAA is Ohio State. It is Ohio U. There is no – and they, they're the ones that need to reach the consensus. You know, they finally came around to name, image, and likeness because about uh, 
you know, all these states passed laws that said it's, it's okay in our state. These guys can do it and you can't keep them from doing it. So then you got to have some kind of little, you know, agreement, right? And they, and they came yeah. around. But you're right about the paying players. Thing. I want to ask you this. Uh, uh, you know, is, is, is the Rose Bowl buildup continues, for example? We all know that, uh, the, you know, the court picket from, uh, Pitt, from Pitt and Keith Walker III from Michigan State are two players who opted out of playing in the Peach Bowl. You know, <laughs> one of the CFP six games uh, opted out. Um, I would think that puts a, takes a little bit of the luster off of that game from an attraction standpoint. Absolutely. Although, did Kenneth Walker the third play against Ohio State? I can't remember. But I digress. Oh, I said it once. I can say it once a show. Uh, but when they show videos or highlight videos of, like, showing C.J. Stroud versus Utah, you know, uh, and they're yet to be uh, – they're, they're – still rising quarterback, you know, and name and image and likeness. Uh, should C.J. Stroud share, you know, in some tor- sort of, uh, for one of another term, ad revenue uh, of a, of somebody using his name, image, and likeness to promote their bowl game? Well, I think that – The know, answer is yes. Is what, yeah. right, right? And if, but if the, if the bowls are interested in stopping the opt-out trend, yeah, people that are paying, you know – tens or hundreds of millions of dollars to sponsor them probably don't need to just slap it on the television logo because that television logo may include a player who's not playing Kenneth Walker. So yes, you want to have a bowl game that ensures a Heisman trophy finalist and a Heisman trophy top 10 finisher are in it. And they're both about to be drafted. Well, then you better pay a market rate to let, to have them in your game. If you want people to watch it and then see if you're Chick Fil A or, you know, Northwestern Mutual or Capital Venture One or whoever's, uh, whoever's currently sponsoring the Rose Bowl, like, understand where your money's going and where you would like it to be. And if you want to ensure the maximum audience, like those guys are the ones that are laying it on the line to be out there. And they there may not be an amount that gets Kenneth Walker or Kenny Pickett to correct their NFL futures. There may not be one, but there may be others. That you could say, well, one game and twenty five thousand. Sure, I'll do it. You know, maybe not. Maybe it wouldn't be the case for Garrett Wilson to risk it for that amount of money, or even for a hundred thousand for one game. I don't know, but you you should at least try if you're yeah. allowed to. Yeah. And um, that's the part. Like, I know that this show makes it seem like I'm suggesting that the money is the solution to all of it, and it's going to all even out, but. In this case, it seems even more apparent that if you don't want players to opt out, then you need to give them more than $500 in a trip to the gift suite, which is great. I wouldn't want to miss that if I was a player. But if I'm a first-round draft pick in four months after that, well, that $500 is not going to really do much for me. Yeah, and if you're one of the 40 players that's probably going to play the most time in a bowl game, you're definitely putting yourself in jeopardy. I mean, no matter whether you're a freshman – you know, first year starter or a uh, a guy aspiring for the NFL draft, you're putting yourself in jeopardy. There's no doubt about it. And for a game, you know, in this modern world, like you said, the only the only three games that matter to most people now, although it isn't necessarily reflected in the ratings, are the two college football playoff semifinals and the championship game. The rest of them are exhibitions. You know, and uh, why should you get something extra for playing in a game that's an exhibition? You know, where, where nothing, quote, is on the line except pride, you know. Uh, I'm with you. Do, you. do you think people around the world, though, I've always been curious about this, and it's, and it's more college football than anything else. Yeah, you can say college basketball, but you've got one and done still in college basketball. Uh, do you think they look at this situation in football where you're in high school and then you have to go to this other level where – in essence, they're not allowed to pay you, but now you got name, image, and likeness, like a lot of amateur athletes have had around the world forever, right? Uh, and and that's if you're good enough there, then you get to go to this other league, which pays you in some in some cases outrageous sums of money to play the same thing you were playing a year ago for a name, image, image and likeness reward, perhaps, and a and a trip through the gift suite at the bowl game. I mean, do you think they look at it as like, what is going on? What, what are the Americans doing in football? What is, you know, 
and are they shaming our real football, which is soccer? I mean, you know what I mean? I mean, do you, how do you think they look at it as like, wait a minute, is that the minor league for that league? Well, yes, it is. But you mean they're not allowed to be paid? Well, not by the teams, but they can go out and generate funds on their own and uh, get a million dollar autograph contract, et cetera. But how do you think they look at that, uh, Austin? I mean, that's the thing, Tim. It doesn't really hold up to any kind of scrutiny, does it? No. It's that old alien test or, or as you said, someone in a different country. Like if you have to explain it to them and they say, well, why? Yeah. Like, what would the NCAA's answer really be? I mean, yes, it, it has always been an education. And we know that there is a dollar amount that that is worth as well. And it's yeah. certainly well worth it and has been for tens of thousands of student athletes that it has been worth their while in I would never criticize that part of it. Yeah. But yeah. To, to, to act like that is the maximum amount that they're worth is just, it's yeah. wrong. Yeah. I mean, and it's blatantly wrong because we know what they're worth as the second they leave and they're millionaires overnight. And you can get into whole other different conversations about the baseball system and minor league baseball or the kids who go for three years to college and, and, play, you know, and, and have a great time and but fractional scholarships, which don't make a ton of sense either to explain to some, you know, an alien uh, or players that, you know, want to go do tennis in college or any of that other stuff instead of trying to join the tour. Like there's a ton of different options, but yeah. to, to take them away or limit them, I just, it doesn't, it doesn't stand to any argument. I just, it's crazy that we're still even having it. Yeah, I mean, baseball and tennis, for example, examples you brought up, they can go ahead and go to that minor league team or or to the tour if they think they're good enough and stuff. They have that, they have that ability, they have that right, you know, and stuff. It's just, uh, yeah, I was just thinking as you were talking here, though, explaining it to the people, uh, to people who don't know much about football, they probably have like they're watching a the game yesterday and they see a they see a uh, Denver Bronco just whack, uh, a, 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 you know, a Cincinnati Bengal who's on the ground like three steps after he's already been on the ground, there's not a penalty there, but then they see a guy score a touchdown and point at a guy as he goes across the goal line. And that's a 15 yard unsportsmanlike conduct penalty or what is holding, right. Or what is pass interference. There's a lot of explaining to do, right? Hey, there is a, and that's <laughs> you're really, football, you're saying, man. <laughs> saying, you're saying a mouthful there, Tim. And there's such a, there is a high bar really to entry to understanding and appreciating football. Yeah. You know, you were kind of joking before we started filming about, you know, you didn't want to talk about soccer, but a lot of things that you've brought up, like, yeah, you know, minor league development or, uh, you know, Ohio state, if they had a player go pro and capitalizing on the sell on fee, you're describing, you know, the kind of the way the international soccer market works. And, you know, it's um, soccer. It just, you can, you can make that sport as complicated as you want to. And in the end, it comes down to putting the ball in the net. And, you know, football at its simplest is putting it over the goal line. But there's so many – every single play is so complicated. It's – sometimes I sit here and think, like, we're talking to an audience that obviously truly cares a lot yeah. about college football or they wouldn't be making it this far into your 150th episode or whatever it is. But I – it's hard to get people into it. And I think that that's another part of this battle that college football and the NFL are both wildly successful, but you can see other sports like that handle their business a little bit differently, continuing to grow. One thing that I know you watch and love, you know, you've always loved all kind of auto racing, but now F1 is having tremendous success and growing their audience because yep. they're understanding what draws people in. And I think that there's, a lot of evidence that just the game of, of, of football itself will continue to bring in massive audiences, but are, they're not quite as large as they used to be. And they seem to, others are taking away that market share. And I think at some point there has to be some recognition that it's not just the game anymore that moves the needle. And it's the people that play it, the, the coaches that are in it, the personalities and the storylines, um, you know, you and I know that very well and how important that is. But I guess when I look at all of these rules and whether that's college or NFL or name, image, and likeness or transfer portal, it's not the game that matters as much anymore. And you just have to count on that audience always being there. It won't be. You have to 
change the way you think about it or else you'll risk losing something that all of us really love. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, that, that goes for the players. I mean, too, I mean, uh, you know, people invest in you. I mean, they invest interest and time in watching you, et cetera. And all of a sudden, if you're at this place and then you go to this place, I'm just talking about, you know, building your image or building, you know, building your image, building your brand. And all right. of a sudden you go over here, all these people invested in you. Well, they, you know, they've lost interest now because really what drove them to you in the first place was their backing for the school you signed with, you know, they're not, yeah, they may care a little bit about, especially if you turn out to be really good and this team didn't play you, <laughs> you know, all that stuff, but they really, they lose interest in you for the most part. And uh, they even, you know, you felt that a little bit about some of these guys who left early for the NFL, leaving early. I mean, they left for the NFL after, after three years and, uh, some people feel like they were abandoned by them just when they got good, you know, and I, I with coaches too. I mean, you, you know, like Ryan Day and his staff, the, these, the amount of time, effort, and even money recruiting guys and then bringing them in and developing them. And just when they have that one good year, they're gone. You know, it's like you don't get the real true payoff from that, but really whose fault is that? But the college football system to begin right. with, you know, that uh, uh, it's just, there's just so many things right now that are kind of eroding it. And I'm not sure. I think people staying away from games like at Ohio state this year, live audience is showing you a little bit of a, a, a glimpse of what could be around the bend. If they don't figure out some way to get a hold of this, I want to ask you this real quick. Uh, speaking of being able to watch guys, et cetera, uh, before we go here, it's Christmas week. I don't want to take up everybody's shopping time with this conversation. Who, who do you expect? Do you expect Garrett Wilson not to play in the Rose Bowl right now. I mean, I think we can throw that out there and just discuss it a little bit. But is that a guy that for sure uh, you feel is not going to play, barring some kind of last minute change of heart? Yeah, I don't. I don't expect Garrett Wilson to play in this game. And uh, to be honest with you, I said last week that I thought the number was going to be three. I still think that it's three. Um, there's a, a fourth that's a little bit on the fence from the same position as Garrett Wilson. Yeah. Uh, I wants to play. Chris Olave would like to play uh, for the reasons that we've talked about before, but man, it, he's also got a lot of money potentially on the line. So you can understand why that's a difficult decision for him. Uh, you know, I'm a little curious why it's taken so long for some of these announcements to come out for Ohio state, uh, you know, and at least, a couple of cases they're already gone and not practicing right now. Yeah. And we, as you know, and I've said a lot of times, I like, I don't want to ruin anybody's big announcement. It's a major life move for them and they deserve the, the ability to, and they can certainly change their mind as well, which is why I'm not saying anything is definitive or not definitive, even if it certainly appears that way. But, you know, when they get to California and they're not there, well, we're all going to know that. Yeah. Uh, you you mean just, you're, wait a minute. You're not going to wait for the availability report. Yeah, no, that won't happen, and it it shouldn't work that way. I mean, no. The, the, when this happened with the Cotton Bowl and Denzel Ward, you know, he took it up until you know it was really the day before where he said, "I'm I'm definitely not going to do it." We kind of thought that was going to be the case for a while, but he went through you know practice stuff throughout the week. He did media availability and then pulled the plug there late. Yeah. And, I don't think that that will be the case here for Ohio State. Um, I would be surprised if it if it was, um, but I don't really know as we sit here right now what's what's taking so long with the process to play out. Well, let me ask you this: Should, it won't be zero. Yeah, it won't be zero. Yeah, but uh, Denzel Ward clearly has something in mind because of the outfit he came out in that night. You know, <laughs> on the sidelines. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't think that was spur of the moment. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm, I guess what I'm saying uh, should should a guy. Should a guy who pulls the plug, should he be allowed to be on the sideline for the Rose Bowl? And, and I'm asking that because I understand this. There are former players, you know, who sometimes are anywhere in and around the sideline, some of whom left early, you know. Uh, Nick Bosa and Joey Bosa were both on the sideline in, uh, what was that, 2018 before the, uh, before the Rose Bowl. And I had talked to Nick Bosa. Obviously, he'd left the team in, what was that, uh, uh, late October or November after getting hurt. And I had talked to him like a couple of days before that at the training facility where Ohio State was working out. And, uh, you know, a lot of guys on the team, you know, still big buddies with him and stuff. They got kind of booed when they got a, 
when, you know, they got kind of booed when they were uh, introduced at the Rose Bowl. Uh, but uh, what, what's just your stance on that? I mean, for example, I thought Diz Award was sort of a distraction for one of another term on the sideline at that Cotton Bowl. Where Meanwhile, I State goes out and takes care of business, you know, with Sam Darnold. Uh, but uh, what, what's your take on that? I think a lot has changed since 2017 and 2018 and those examples that you brought up in that, you know, the first few years that you have opt-outs, there was, man, is this the trend? Are bowl games dead? Is everybody yeah. going to opt out? Who's going to get, get drafted? And it hasn't been as severe as the, as a lot of initial reactions were, but it's also become a lot more understandable and, and as it's become common for a first and second round draft pick to pl- to not play, I think that their teammates understand why. I think that a lot more of the fan base understands uh, what would be at stake for them. They understand as well that the Rose Bowl doesn't have anything to do with the national championship, shouldn't have anything to do with any rankings that matter, and those don't anyway. Yeah. Um, they'll get a banner for finishing fourth or fifth or sixth in the AP poll. So – that doesn't have any implication on it. And then there's other, you know, you say, okay, well, maybe there's a a benefit for this. We're going to, if you're Ohio State, you get to see Julian Fleming and Marvin Harrison and Snake uh, Peak and get uh, Emeka Buka out there. Like now you, there's a greater understanding and appreciation for what the players are putting on the line and what it may mean for a current season or the future season. And I think their teammates, we saw, you know, C.J. Stroud talked about this two weeks ago before he left for the Heisman when he was asked about uh, the possibility for both Garrett Wilson and Chris Olave. He said, I wish I, w- I would love to play with them. They're my brothers, and I'd love to do it one more time. But if not, I understand why, and yeah. I won't blame them. And I think that some that doesn't make you know Garrett Wilson a potential distraction if he's on the sideline. Like He gave a ton to the program, and C.J. Stroud said – this would not be a selfish decision on his part. He's been incredibly selfless, especially Chris Olave as well as a captain over four years and coming back. Like yep. They deserve to make the, the decision that's best for them. And if th- they would still want to be around them, I think, uh, if that's possible, and you know what, who knows what restrictions will be in place for somebody who's not uh, around the team all week. I don't know how any of that's going to play out, but if they're allowed to be on the sideline with Ohio State and they opt out, I personally don't have a problem with that. Yeah, that's the thing with football, man. Because you know, if they're, if for example, if they're on the sideline, they're going to be looking around at that Rose Bowl. You know, this isn't a. No offense to the Liberty Bowl. This is not the Liberty Bowl. I've been <laughs> to the Liberty Bowl. You know, I know where the pool and weed eater, or whatever it's called now, Independence Bowl is. You know, I mean, when you look around that stadium, this is this is the oldest bowl game. This is the bowl game that started bowl games. You know, this is the granddaddy might be the great granddaddy when you really think about it uh, at this point, because there's now what 40 something people in the, in the family. <laughs> Got a lot of illegitimate. Potential. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of people came from a, wow. Well, yeah. Wow. We pop. Oh, well. Anyway, but uh, I was but fine. You're related so, to the road pool? No. Yeah. Way. Wow. I don't remember going through Pasadena, uh, but uh, yeah, that was, man, that was a long, long night in Pasadena, I guess, but I digress. Uh, I've only said it twice now. Uh, yeah, I mean, but they're going to be sitting there and going, wow, this this is pretty cool, you know. Now, a couple of those guys may have already been to the Rose Bowl, you know, four, three years ago, Urban Meyer's last game, et cetera, when the, when the whistle was passed to uh, Ryan Day and a, a new defensive coordinator was coming in right around the corner, kind of like this year, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, they're going to be going, wow, man, this would have been cool to play in. If only they can guarantee me I don't get hurt, like like Jalen Smith got hurt, or like Jake Butt got hurt, or you know, name a few more guys. Boy, you put the helmet on and you get between the lines, you're in jeopardy. There is no doubt about it. Like like no other sport. Agreed. Maybe hockey, but even hockey isn't like football. Yeah, I mean, it is a violent sport. So anytime you're playing it, obviously there's risk and. I think a lot of people, you know, suspected we saw this with Nick Bosa that, well, well, if there's that much risk, maybe they're just going to stop playing their entire junior seasons and protecting their draft stock. And the the dilemma or equation or whatever is that to play the sport, you still 
you know, to be good at it, you still have to play it. Yeah. And so that hasn't really become any sort of norm with people just skipping the entire year to prepare for the draft or the combine because you can't, <clears throat> that's not football. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, taking one game out of it is a little bit different. And, and I think that that's why when you see these guys struggling with that decision, uh, and again, this doesn't happen everywhere because not every program has three or four, five, you know, early round draft picks trying to protect anything. Right. The state situation is not the same as Utah's for this game. Yeah. That's just a simple reality as well. So, <clears throat> you know, that's why we're having this, this discussion and it's not, it hasn't spread to everyone around the country, but um, you know, it, it is another fact of life in the changing, you know, landscape of college football, all these other things that we laid out with image likeness, transfer portal, bowl opt outs. It's all part of it because yeah. they're, it's all happening at once kind of where the NCAA got slapped in the face and they could have made these changes a long time ago or incrementally and gotten used to it. But that's we're having to deal with it all on the fly just because there was so much resistance to it for so long. Yeah, exactly. But like you just pointed out, I mean, this is a good point too. If you just kind of came out and said, Hey, these guys aren't playing, you know, uh, these guys are, are playing, you know, and move on. That's the best way is to rip the Band-Aid off and just move on instead of leaving people in a quandary, you know, uh, uh, making people sneak around and find out things, you know, like you already know some things, you know, I know some things. But the bottom yeah. line is you don't want to take away from from a person's right to uh, to to either say that or not say it, because that's happened a few times before, too, you know. Uh, but I think it helps everybody in the, in the sense of how they envision the game coming up, even helps the players uh, who are going to play in the game sort of kind of come out in the open. Now it's, now it's their time to uh, maybe talk to the media, their time to shine. Uh, you know, there's all kinds of reasons why you, you announce these things sooner rather than later. And I think from their perspective, when I say that I can't believe it's happened this long, I'm going to be uh, fair to them as well. I understand that all things being even, and if you could guarantee they were going to be healthy, Garrett Wilson would love to play one more game at Ohio State. He is, has been a very good teammate. He's matured a ton over the course of his career. Yep. You know, opportunity to be in the Rose Bowl, maybe make a play that you you get to sign a picture of someday. You know, I don't know. I'll, if that was the case for him, he doesn't want to skip a game. You know, and that's, yeah. you know, maybe deep down he hopes that there's a, a way that he could take a, a potion that would keep him healthy and he'd get to play in the Rose Bowl or that he's doesn't, you know, he was worried that maybe Ohio state fans and Buckeye nation would say, ah, he never really cared about us. He won't even play in the Rose Bowl, like, and turn their back. I, I can understand it being in his position and social media and, you know, wanting to play with the brotherhood, not wanting to be looked at like he's quitting. I can understand that part of it too. And that's the other reason, like whatever they decide, I'm, yeah. I'm fine with that. There might have been a few players who were as affected or as hurt leaving that field at Michigan uh, a few weeks ago as Chris Olave and Garrett Wilson, but no That's one more right. hurt. And uh, the the desire, the goal to get one one more shot at trying to grab that brass ring, really that gold ring at the end of the year was gone. And, you know, I don't think anyone put out more for their team this year than Chris Olave and Garrett Wilson. Maybe some did as much. Right. But, uh, you know, whatever happens with these guys headed into the Rose Bowl or during the Rose Bowl, they, they can leave Ohio State with their heads held high. And I sound like I'm about to do a public service announcement for them. <laughs> I just really have enjoyed watching them play. And as I said on one of our rapid reactions on LettermanRow.com a couple of weeks ago, selfishly, I would like to see them play. Absolutely. Because C.J. Stroud to Chris Olave and Garrett Wilson and Jackson Smith and Jigba is the greatest passing uh, foursome quartet in Ohio State history. Maybe in Big Ten history when you think about on one team. But yeah, I would have to say that. And one of the greatest maybe in college football history. You would like to see that one more time. This selfishly as a fan because that's what that's what you're playing for finally is the reason you get to play in the NFL is because people pay money 
and uh, and or turn on their television sets and pay for a cable box or whatever so they can watch you do your thing, you know? Otherwise, it wouldn't be an NFL. It'd be leatherheads still, you know? And uh, so it's the fans, you know, I understand the fans, and the fans do deserve a little bit of this, maybe. But you have to also count in the Jeopardy part of it. And at this point, the Jeopardy outweighs uh, maybe that part of it. But I, I know selfishly I'd like to see them all play just because I'd like to see that one more time, wouldn't you? Yeah, well said. Agreed. Yeah. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, I've said enough already. I was on the radio again this week. I said a lot then. Uh, we'll have another podcast uh, the week of the the week of the game. <laughs> That's gone. That's come and gone, right? The That's week gone. of the Rose Bowl. Don't uh, get that one back. Hey, the week of the Rose Bowl game. Uh, a little something with uh, my man uh, Austin Ward. And I appreciate Matt Zenitz from uh, on three dot com, who's uh, covering the transfer portal about as well as anybody else in the country, probably better. And uh, I just wondered, do you have to wear your mask in the transfer portal? What do you think, Austin? Well, I think a lot, of, rules, a lot of crossing going on there. Well, rules are unclear, but yeah, uh, it's pretty crowded in there, man. Trying to stay six feet away from everyone inside the portal. Yeah, it kind of reminds you of that slip and slide. It had the little slinky thing you'd slide through and it hit the slip and slide, you know. That's what <laughs> I think of as a transfer portal. But, ladies Maybe. and gentlemen, until next week, until post Christmas pre-Rose Bowl game podcast. This is Tim May for Austin Ward. We'll see you then.